Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. Kwame Alexander, our guest today, is a poet, he's an educator, and he's a New York Times bestselling author of 39 books. That's just showing off. He's also the author of a book that many of you and certainly your kids might have read, a huge bestselling book called The Crossover. Known for his unique style of blending poetry and prose to create engaging and relatable stories for young readers, Kwame has earned countless awards, including, this one's a big deal, the Newbery Medal for the crossover. My friends, today Kwame joins us to share his powerful excerpts from his most recent book. It's an intimate and it's a non-traditional memoir titled, Why Fathers Cry at Night. You're going to hear lessons from his journey of learning how to love, how brokenness and beauty can play together as one, and what that really means to each of us in our stories. My friends, this conversation will inspire bravery and vulnerability in all of us who have experienced the passion, the heartbreak, the failure, and the joy of love. So without further ado, let me bring him on to the stage. He is my buddy. He's about to become yours. His name is Kwame Alexander. Kwame, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hey, John. Good to be here. Man, it is, as you just heard, a huge honor to have you on. If I was to bump into you, though, in one of your favorite writing spots, uh, Panera Bread, near the fireplace with maybe a lemonaded hand, and I sat down next to you and said, hey, man, I'm John O'Leary. Who are you? In addition to your name, how would you introduce yourself? It depends on where I was. <laughs> if I was sort of in the middle of a thought, I had the rhythm going, John, I'd be probably pretty quick and just say, oh, yeah, hey, I'm I'm a writer. I'm working on a book. and that, But that's always sort of a entry because, oh, really? What's your book about? Totally. So I'd get, I'd sort of get into it a little bit and share a little bit about my life. But that would be the thing that defined me, I think, that I'm a writer. So answer that second part, because if, if I'm in that writing studio with you or Panera or the, 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 this London area of writing, mm -hmm. and I hear that you're a writer, I'm going to ask you, so what do you write about? So Kwame Alexander, what do you write about? Everything comes down to love. So I'm writing about relationships, whether it be between a son and a father, whether it be between best friends, whether it be between a husband and a wife. I'm writing about those, the things that help us get through this, the day to day. And that's uh -huh. love. And that's, that's familial love. It's romantic love. It's self-love. Like love is a big thing for me. And so ultimately that's the space I'm writing from and that's what I'm writing about. That's that's sort of the underlying current. So I'm going to go back to uh, the foundational piece of your life and, and talk about where you received that love and where you got it, where it was nurtured within you and, and maybe some places where you did not receive it until later on in life. So let, let's back all the way up to St. Luke's Hospital you were born, baby. You came into the world, and uh, the first person who held you was your mom. She is a heroic individual. Would you just celebrate your mom for a moment with us? August 21st, 1968, Manhattan. I was her firstborn child. For three years, it was just me, my mom, and dad. They were in grad school. My mother was she made everything fun and interesting and cool. Like she was my first teacher, my first librarian. I remember as a three-year-old, I had a, a wooden box where you put different shapes in the holes. And she and I would play that. And I remember there was this one particular time where she couldn't play with me anymore. Like I had to figure out how to get the shapes in myself. And I, I didn't like that. I wanted to do it with her, but she had something to do, whether she had to cook or go do some, you know, write a paper or something because she was in grad school. But she ultimately, by virtue of her getting up and leaving me there to figure it out, she left me to sort of my own creativity and innovation. And she was always doing stuff like that. I had some pretty amazing parents, man. And, and they both showed their love in different ways but ways that I knew I was loved mm. in a really empowering way. There's a story you've shared in your book, and I've heard you, heard you share it a couple times live, 
uh, where you are about three years old and uh, you get in trouble at school, man. And I, I think it, it <laughs> speaks volumes about you, uh, but even louder about your mother. Would you share that story with our audience? We were a very bookish family. And so, you know, my mother read to me a lot of poetry. And my favorite book was Fox and Socks by Dr. Seuss. And I would recite that book around the house at bedtime. I knew it, loved to read it with her. Fox, socks, knocks, box, fox in socks, socks in box. Like I loved it. And so at school one day, I was in a preschool, I had built a, a castle out of some blocks. And I was excited to show my mother this castle that I built. It was a pretty huge castle. I spent a lot of time on it. But I couldn't show it to her because this, this kid in my class kicked him over. Thought he was being funny, I guess. You know, that really angered me. And so I, I, I went up to him with the only weapons I had, which were my words. And I screamed. And this, my mother, of course, recount, have recounted this story for me, which is why I know it so, so well. I screamed, those were my blocks that you flipped. Lest you want a quick payback, better fix my quick block stack. And the kids started crying, John. And so the teachers told my mother that I was arrogant and I intimidated all the kids with my words. And my mother's response was, thank you. We teach him to use his words. So that's the kind of house I grew up in, man. It just it occurs to me that so many years later I would I would have issues with how how much my father loved words. But they were the same in the sense that they knew the power of words and how they could transform a life and then and build confidence and help you find your voice. And that was an instance as a three-year-old where my mother, you know, that was indicative mm -hmm. of how we lived. There are three words that I heard from my dad a lot growing up, and there's so many occasions when I heard them, it's hard to remember just one, but one sticks out clearly, and I wanted to share it with you and then get your take on your own father. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the day that I accidentally blew up my parents' house. I caught myself on fire. I find myself in the emergency room. My dad rushes in. And the very first thing he said to me is not, why did you cause the fire? Why did you burn down the house? Look what you've done. You might die from the thing you did. All this stuff, all the judgment. The right. very first thing my dad said to me was, John, look at me when I'm talking to you. I love you. I love, mm. I heard that so often in my life. And on that day, wow. I knew that my friend Kwame, those are three words. You didn't hear, hear a whole lot from your dad growing up. You whispered about your dad. I want you to roar a little bit about him right now. What, what, what was your father like growing up? Dude, I never heard that from my dad. Like, God bless your father for giving you that thing you needed in that moment, those powerful words. I never heard that from my father. That is not to say I didn't know he loved me. Like, I knew he loved me. I could never put my finger on how. I mean, he was there. All right. I, I got my tennis racket when I wanted to play tennis. Like, he was there. Um, contrarily, my mother said it all the time. Like, so, so, there, so, but I never heard that. Like, I didn't hear that until maybe, like, I'm 50. I'll be 55 soon. Right. I just heard it this year. And so that was the first time I've heard it from him. So, you know, what was he like growing up? He was either writing a sermon, preaching, reading a book, writing a book, publishing a book, writing a newspaper article, talking about books, asking me to read a book, telling me to go read the dictionary, selling a book. Like it, he was obsessed. He was a logophile, a verbal maniac. So it was all words and literature and books. And that sort of defined his whole existence. It framed him. It enveloped him. And so when you're four and five years old, yeah, you want to read all the books. You want to read Man, Child, and the Promised Land or, or Stevie or Uptown or all these children's books. And then when you're 11 or 12, you don't necessarily want to read your father's dissertations. You don't want to have conversations about books then. You want to play games. You want, to, you want to hang out with your friends. 
So around 11 or 12, I began to rebel against that very bookish household that I had you know, grown up in and been nurtured in. So, and that was tough. That was hard because though that was the way he loved. And that was the way I sort of moved away from. But going to college, I wanted to, you know, get as far away from books as possible and decided I was going to be a doctor. So that didn't help in terms of, you know, again, when I look back on it, like when I wrote this memoir, one of the things that came out of it is I realized how my father loved. And I may have wanted him to love me in a certain way, but he loved me in the way that he knew how. And I just shared that at age 54 was the first time I heard him say, I love you. And the way he said it was, he sent me a text message at about 11 o'clock at night. And he said, you know, Kwame, when I was your age, when I was younger, my parents never said I loved you to me. He said, I knew my mother loved me because when I was in the Air Force, she wrote me once a week. She said, he said, my father never wrote me, but I knew he loved me because he bought the stamps and the envelopes for her. I thought that was really special, man. Like we, we love in the way that we learn. Well, he's loving you in the way that he can and the way that it was modeled for him. And you, this young man learned to embrace the gift of words, but you also push it away. I know you went, you thought you'd go pre-med. Yeah. What- it though that ultimately changed you away from serving as Dr. Alexander into author, poet, servant, Alexander. Yes. It's interesting because isn't it ironic? This thing I tried to get away from is the thing that defines me. Completely. And so now as we sit here, me talking to John O'Leary about, you know, my 39th book about my memoir, Why Fathers Cry at Night. And Today's my daughter's birthday. She's 15. And we're, we're taking her out to dinner tonight. But we can't take her until dad finishes his work. And his work is words. And so how ironic is it that in many ways I've become my father. And so I, I try to extend him a lot of grace, John, because my hope and my prayer is that my kids will do the same for me. Totally. But yeah, I'm wanting to be a doctor. That was my thing. And then I took organic chemistry sophomore year and everything changed, John. (laughs) I said, uh, this may not work. That would rush me away from uh, the emergency room as well. It's one thing to be pushed away from medicine, but then you were pulled toward language. The very thing you wanted to run from. So I'm, I'm curious, what drew you back in? Well, I think I wasn't necessarily running away from books and literature and language, I was running away from sort of the way it was being framed for me. I didn't find it very interesting. Like my dad's an excellent writer. He's an amazing writer. He's written some history books, educational books. But again, no 11, 12, 15, 16 year old wants to read that stuff. So I didn't find it particularly interesting. In college, I began to sort of find my way back to poetry, reading and writing love poems. And that got me a few dates with some women who were above my station. You know, it got me married. And so I sort of found my way back to a love of literature through love poems. That was the thing for me. When did you realize not only was it a love of words, of literature, of language, but also something you were gifted at at providing others? Yeah, that's a good question. I sort of knew that from a very early age. Like, even though I shied away from the literature through the lens of my father, my father was very like, his presence is, you know, he's tall physically. He's a big man. He's vocal. He's loud even though I sort of tried to move out of that space, that realm of of his dominance through the, you know, through his lens of literature, I still loved writing. Like I would still write in my journal. I'd still make up stories. So I still, I always loved it. But I think the moment I knew that this was going to be something that I'm going to do more of, I'm going to make it a, a part of my life, that would have happened in my junior, sophomore year at Virginia Tech, where I began to write poetry as protest, All right. to protest some of the things happening on campus, 
and, and the poems resonated with students. And I began to take poetry classes with Nikki Giovanni. And I began to get to develop a little bit more control of my words, be more intentional. That probably happened in sophomore, between sophomore and junior year. Um, I saw how the words resonated with other people. And that intrigued me in a way that was empowering. So, man, when I when I bring on a poet or an author, I always bookmark a couple pages to have them read live. The issue with you is I was bookmarking almost every single page as I was going through the white. So now I'm in trouble because we only have a half an hour left or so. <laughs> and the book's going to take longer than that for you to do a live reading. So I, we can't read it all. I beg our listeners to check it out. One of the poems that moved me, and they all did, but one that moved me in particular was one called The Heavyweight of Fatherhood. W would you be willing to read that to our listeners right now? My father sometimes loved us like a boxer, would tag us with biting jibes when he was too busy to answer a question, throw numbing jabs that stabbed our ears and growing hearts when he was upset. Round after round, my mother would referee, but he would back even her in the ropes. The man would not stop until he knocked us all down. Then, when he was satisfied that we were down for the count, my sisters emptied of joy, me defeated and repressed. He'd retreat to the corner and massage our wounds with a softening tongue, an honest humor, a familial allegiance that lifted us all up, that left us each smiling and revived and almost forgetting the sting of his love. Yeah, one of the things about writing this memoir is that I didn't give a whole lot of thought to how my father would respond to the book because I didn't necessarily think I was writing a memoir at first. Oh. I thought I was just writing a collection of poems. But once I realized what I was writing, I definitely was, you know, I was a bit panicked and anxious and nervous about how he would respond to it. At the same time, I hope that it would open a door for he and I to talk about things we've never talked about. I remember when it, when I finally sent him the book to read it in, after it was already out, he made a joke that he was gonna sue me for defamation of character. He would have won. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? And then he began to send me a series of text messages that opened up the door even further. And we both walked through it. In many ways, John, I feel like writing that poem, writing many of the pieces that I wrote about him and my, our relationship, it helped. It helped us have a more open, honest, authentic man-to-man -man relationship as opposed to just father and son. And while it was scary in the beginning, I'm just I'm glad it happened. I feel so much better and so much more connected to him now. You know, I, I think all of us long for a happy ending in all of our stories. And this book has whispers of hope. And there's a, an awful mm -hmm. belief that better days are to come in your family, in your relationships, yeah. in your life. And, and yet to pretend like this has been easy or is currently easy is a great lie. And you don't pretend like it is. But you're growing and you're understanding and you're empathizing. And one, one of the stories that I think reveal that not only are you realizing this about your dad, but you're starting to understand how it shows up in your life uh, is your father's eulogy. And when I saw the mm -hmm. title, I, of course, thought that this was going to be you delivering a eulogy. And it wasn't. And yet in reading this, it added a lot of color into your dad's character and into the, some of the struggles he felt. So would you honor us and kind of put a book into this and read your father's eulogy? That's a hard piece to read. I don't know if I can read it, but I can say this. As a 17-year-old, I wake up. Everybody's getting ready for my grandfather's funeral, my father's father. My grandfather was a tremendous man. He was the deacon in the church, just a, a pillar of the community. I remember he worked in his later years at a, a nursing home. Right. And he was the janitor. And so I remember one day my girlfriend and I were picking him up and we went in to get him and we're walking out and he's talking to my girlfriend. And then we get to the car and I go around to get in the driver's seat. And my grandfather says, get back over here, boy. And I'm like, huh? 
Like you always open the door for a young lady. I was like, oh, sorry, granddaddy. <laughs> he was just like a real dude, or just a great dude. And so we're all getting ready for my grandfather's funeral. And I remember my mom says, all right, let's go. And I said, where's daddy? And she just looks at me and she says, he's in the room. And I go in the room and my dad is in the bed mm. under the covers. And I, I said, daddy, aren't you coming? And he says, no. And I do not understand it. And I just start bawling. Like, how are you not going to your own father's funeral? And so that poem was me trying to make some sense out of it in that moment. Like, I wrote that piece, like, pretty soon after that happened. And we went to the funeral, and my father didn't come. And I never saw him, like, emote around it. I think later in life, he said that he didn't need to say goodbye to him again. But I know that there was some other issues. And when I think in my own life, I could not imagine how my father would not go to his father's funeral. And then I think about my relationship with my oldest daughter. And I could have never imagined this. Like, it's, I've learned to stop judging people. I tell you that, John, like, life is a storm. And it will fail you. And the hope is that you are resilient mm. and that you have surround yourself with people who love you and who you love so that you can make it to the rainbow. Yeah. Because the storm is coming again. And we all just deal with it how we deal with it. And we try to get better and we try to grow. Man, so well said. So you, you mentioned a moment ago, 39 books and our listeners are taking notes and they're like, wow, man, this guy's got it all figured out professionally. What, what, a, what an overnight success guy this man is. And yet what you know and what you've shared very vulnerably and very honestly is it was not at all an overnight success and it was not at all easy. And it was costly. I think four or five years into your marriage as you are still writing but no one's reading it and no one's buying it. And <laughs> the lights are flickering and the car is being repoed, literally. How did that affect your relationship with your wife? Well, first of all, John, I love how you did your research. Dude, you know everything. Dude, I care about you, man. I, I love your story. And I, what I love about it, Kwame, is it's not, this is not Cinderella about to get swept off her feet. This is rough, right. ugly and messy and sad. And to me, that sounds a lot like life. And yeah. uh, Whatever reason you went into the corners and you unpacked yours. I knew I was going to be a writer. I had every intention and my wife supported me. Like she was like, okay, you're a good writer. I mean, I, it wooed her in my love poems. So she knew I could write. I think that the disconnect for her was that as a 23 year old, I didn't have the maturity to understand you got to get a job too, dude. <laughs> so I didn't make, I was like, I'm going to be a writer. And so there was that level of immaturity that didn't make that connection that you have a newborn child, you have a wife, you have a family, and you have a responsibility to take care of, to do your part. And at a certain point, it just became unfathomable and, and unrealistic for her to be able to continue in that situation. I get it. And, I, and the car being repossessed was sort of the thing the icing on that cake, as it were, that I had at that point in my writing, my writerly life, I hadn't figured out you need to do the things you have to do in yeah. order to do the things you want to do. And that didn't come for another few years. But the sacrifice there was that I lost my family. There was a divorce. And then I went from seeing my kid every day to seeing her every other weekend. I played a huge role in that by not understanding the level of response or not acting on the level of responsibility that I should have. And to this day, I still feel bad about it. I extend myself grace, but you know, it happened. When my friends who've gone through a divorce, think about that divorce or talk about the divorce, they almost always talk about the bad parts that led to it the car being repoed, that person not doing their part. It's focused on the negativity and frequently the kids walk away from that relationship thinking that it must have always been negative. And one of the beautiful things, Kwame, you did in this book and in your poems within it is you celebrated the fact that it wasn't always bad. The car wasn't always repoed. She didn't always hate my guts and I did not always hate hers either. 
you talked about the love. And I thought, I thought that was a really unusual and new way of looking at what the relationship once was. Is there either a poem from within your book that you want to share, or even an angle that you want to share with our audience of why you did that? For me, I think the narrative that we all have come to know when it comes to divorce, that we all perpetuate is that when a marriage ends, it's a negative thing. And that the thing that you focus or remember is the thing that ended the, the marriage, like that whatever the bad thing or, or the negative thing were as it is. And I didn't want that to be the, the narrative when my daughters think about divorce. I didn't want that to be the, the thing. And so I thought I would sort of change it up because I'm going to try to focus on the things that were wonderful and not necessarily were woeful. Like, let's focus on the triumph and not necessarily the tragedy. That was part of the reason why I wanted to write this book is to talk about how I loved, where I may have failed, where I hope to be better. And what are those things that I want to remember when it comes to the love in my life that can guide me? This is a piece I wrote called Instructions for Leaving. And it's a piece that I wrote for Steph, who I was married to for 23 years. Once the earthquake is settled, accommodate the anger, let it move in, fix it dinner, then put it to bed. Part as partners in wonder, stargazers discovering possibility, two people who dreamed a world yesterday. Keep a room in your heart. Do not let your tomorrows explode. Pay attention to memory. Honor the naughty and the jubilant, the storm that felled you, but also the rainbow. Be neighborly. Have less thunder in your mouth. Make a joyful noise. Do not waste time as rivals, erstwhile lovers who no longer laugh. Play the new music of your life softly like a sunrise mission. Mourn the changing season. Step out into what you have lost and accomplished. Have afternoon tea and talk about it. Remind each other to leave something behind that makes you smile. Now, go be grateful. It's beautiful. So you, you write this for Steph and you write it for your daughters and you write it for yeah. our, us readers. When you say now, go be grateful from that relationship and from this woman who you loved and still love, but you married for more than two decades from that relationship for what are you grateful look at all the stuff we built together look at this amazing kid who's turning 15 today <laughs> look at this amazing business we built with 39 books and and tv shows look at the tr the places we've traveled together look at the friendship the friends we've spent time with just look at our lives and what we've been able to do for our families so this particular thing this particular aspect of our relationship didn't work out how we thought it would, but all the other stuff worked out tremendously. So let's be grateful for that. Glass half full, not half empty. You are probably best known for your book, The, the Crossover, and it barely came to light. Had the first uh, editor and publishing company had their say, it would not have happened. And if the second company had had their say, it would not have happened. And if the 21st had had their way, it would not have happened. When you create something and you know it's good and worthy, but it's just not happening, what keeps you going and saying, I'll try again, I'll try again, I'll try again, until finally I get that yes? Yeah, it goes back to that thing as a three-year-old, the teacher saying to my mom, your son is arrogant. <laughs> he intimidates all the kids with his words. And my mother understood it. The words are the thing that help him build his confidence. They help him find his voice. They may call it arrogance. I think my parents understood that, John, we are the greatest, not because we are better than anyone, but because no one is better than us. I think my parents understood the level of confidence that words could afford me. I've always been confident in myself from the very beginning, even when I had no reason to be. For example, freshman year in high school playing tennis, the number 12 player on the team out of 12. Like I was the worst player on the team. I somehow made the team. Four years later, I was the number one player in the district. Like I started at the bottom 
but me being able to make it to the top, it fed the confidence even more. So all throughout life, you find yourself swimming in a sea of no's. And, he, and eventually, if you swim long enough, you will make it to a yes. Sometimes you won't, sometimes you will. But each time you make it to a yes, it makes the journey through the no's shorter the next time. And so you find yourself building your confidence. So by the time I got to the crossover, I was 45 years old. I had been told no thousands of times in my life and probably had hundreds of yeses that I'd been able to see through. So that five-year period where I was being told no to the crossover, yeah, I was sad. I cried. I was doubtful. But I also knew that if you stuck with it, the yes could potentially come. And I also knew that if you didn't stick with it, the yes was never going to come. Hmm. So I built up that sort of immunity to the no's. But that only comes by stick to and resilience and persistence and people around you telling you, yo, you're good. You're good. Like you can't have people around you who were saying, nah, you ain't good. That's the only reason I was able to sort of survive that five years. But yeah, it was hard. It was tough. It was sad. It was pain. And I doubted myself, but I knew I couldn't give up. As a guy who tries to model that in my own life, a, a man who fails his way forward, I'm not in my head for the listeners who are only hearing our voices. I, I agreed, man. You got to keep stepping forward because if you don't, you'll never hear the yes. And you'll never recognize what was possible ultimately in your life. I'm I'm amazed though, man, that you built a beautiful career writing basically fiction, writing about others, writing about things that moved you, but never writing about the reflection in the mirror or those who are closest to you. Right. Those who loved you most, you weren't even open on and honest with. You, right. you heard many times the story of going to Puerto Rico with your two best buddies from childhood, essentially. And those guys didn't even know you, man. And these were your buddies. So now I'd like to read. Uh, the second paragraph of essentially the first page of your book to uh, remind our readers how quickly you go deep in this one. Because this probably blew your Puerto Rican party buddies away when they read this. Here we go. My mother died on September 1st, 2017. Within a month, the cracks of my marriage emerged. They would eventually become impassable canyons. Within two years, our eldest would pack her belongings, clothes, books, heart, and leave home and leave us. And overnight, I was barefoot on Everest. Marcus Garvey without a ship. The puzzle was now sky. The pieces of my love life scattered across it. And my mother, the one person who seemed to know how to live like a rainbow in the clouds, the woman with the answers I needed like a winter needed snow, was resting in peace, and I drifted in sadness, seeking memory. That is a shot across the bow. Uh, we're not talking about crossover anymore, man. We're going a little bit deeper into uh, your life and ultimately our lives. So for a man who wore a mask or maybe maybe just wasn't fully vulnerable with others, why did you decide to go so deep in this book? Why go all in? I did not plan on going all in. One of the reasons I asked my friends in Puerto Rico, I said, guys, have I been an open book? Have I been vulnerable? And they sort of laughed at me and said, I've always been surface. One of the reasons I didn't understand that at first is because I've written poetry most of my life. And poetry is a distillation of the heart. You can't be more vulnerable than poetry. And because I had written poetry, I thought, oh, well, I've been vulnerable. But the thing is, John, when you're writing poetry, you're writing metaphor and simile and figurative language. And so you're hiding behind the metaphor. You don't have to say the thing. You can sort of allude to it. I had been doing that. And so when I started writing Why Fathers Cry at Night, it was just love poems. It was more hiding behind the metaphor. And then I think I wrote a prose piece and then I wrote a recipe and then I wrote another prose piece. And before you knew it, my editor said, Kwame, you know, you're writing a memoir. And I didn't process that in an artistic or an emotional or a literary sense. I processed it in a business sense because I'm also a businessman, John. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to sell a lot of memoirs. I'm going to sell a lot of books. 
I'm gonna sell a lot more books than I would if this was a poetry book. And so I began to think of it from a commercial standpoint. The first time I viewed this as a piece of art from an emotional standpoint was in February and I read the advanced reading copy and I freaked out and I had a panic attack and I called my editor and I said, we cannot publish this book. It's just too much, it's too vulnerable. And after she told me the books were in the warehouse and she talked me off a ledge, that was the moment I realized I went all in, but I could do nothing about it. Like it was the books were gonna be in the stores. And so John, I never set out to go all in. That was consistent with my sort of personality and with my modus operandi. Or John, some part of me understood how necessary it was for me to go all in, to save me because not being open and forthcoming and honest and vulnerable was not was no longer serving me. I was on a collision course to some place that some part of me knew that you do not want to be in, dude. And so it's quite possible that I saved myself. I mean, I know I ended up saving myself, but I was not conscious of it, man. But I am so glad that it happened. You title this thing, and I think I need an answer to it. So Why Fathers Cry at Night by Kwame Alexander. So tell me, my friend, father of two, why do dads cry at night? I think for the most part, men have not been taught how to be open and forthcoming and honest, and we have not been shown it. And when I think about the fact that vulnerability, it breeds authenticity. And authenticity brings out some of the best relationships that we can have with the people we love and the people who love us. But men are not taught that for the most part. We aren't shown that. The idea of crying at night is you don't have to be public. You don't have to share and be open. Like it's, it's the metaphor of doing things in the dark. It's like, no, we got to bring out our we got to bring our hearts to the light, man. We got to show ourselves to the people who love us and the people who we love. We got to do it in the light. It's got to be open. It doesn't serve us to not share, to not reveal who we are, who we ought to be. When I write, I don't think about mass audience reading it. I think about one individual. And the more I can actually put skin and bones on that person, the more radically vulnerable I can be with that person. And so when I, when I wrote a book years ago called On Fire, chapter four, I think was about vulnerability. And I wrote it for my son. And I wanted him to recognize it's not titled Dear Jack, but every word in that chapter is ultimately Dear Jack, Dear Jack, Dear Young Man, because you will become an older man and vulnerability will not be something you want to grab onto. Right. This book almost unmistakably for your daughters, one who you're taking out to dinner here shortly in London, the other one who you're still trying to rekindle a relationship with. When they come to the end of this book and they come to a part of their life where they get to see their dad even more clearly, what do you hope they know about you? My prayer is that they don't find themselves in life at a point in their lives where they have questions like I have from my mom and I can never ask her because she's gone. I hope that they come to a point in their lives where maybe there's something they were afraid to ask me, like I was afraid to ask my father, or never talk to me about, like I've never talked to my father about some things, because they have some of these answers in this book, or they have a, they have some conversation starters in this book. I hope they never have to be in the place where I was, and that they can see sort of their father in a more holistic way. That's my hope and my prayer. And that somehow may give them a glimpse into how he loved them. Kwame Alexander, we have had the joy of bringing on about 600 friends on this Live Inspired podcast, and uh, we're honored to have you as one of them. We walk all of them through what we call the Live Inspired Seven at the end of the conversation. So uh, buckle up, get ready for it. Question number one is what's been the most impactful or inspirational book you've ever read? (laughs) There is a book called I Am Not Sidney Poitier, and it is a comic novel written by Percival Everett. And I strive to do with words a fraction of what he does. And I just read it at least once a year, and I find myself laughing 
It is the most intellectual, postmodern, avant-garde novel. It's one of the most ever written, and it's just hilarious. I love it. What's one positive characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a little kid growing up that you wish you exhibited it as brilliantly today? Wow, that's a great question, man. I love to talk. I love to talk to people. And I was an engaged conversationalist. I found that being so busy in my life, I don't have as many just engaged conversations. I, I tell myself I don't have time for them, but I miss, I miss that. I hope you have one tonight at dinner. Thank you. If your home caught fire and all living things are out and you have an opportunity of running back in and grabbing one thing, one physical item that matters to you, what would you come racing back out with? That's interesting because I thought about that recently. I went to Kenya and my suitcase was lost. I remember Steph saying, the cool thing is everything in there is replaceable. And so when I think about if my house burned down and there's one thing, wow, that is a great question, man. I don't know if it says what it says about me that I cannot think of anything. There's a Newberry medal for the crossover that's sitting in a glass case. And that would be the natural thing that I think I would... As long, as long as the family is okay, I don't see that there's anything I would need to grab other than that. So we come out wearing the medal, man. Earns the heart. If you could sit on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who do you want seated right next to Kwame Alexander? And my daughters. One on both sides, eh? Yep. What's the best advice you've ever received? Hands down, my father. A couple of things he says, he says, don't surround yourself with people who have less to lose than you do. Mm -hmm. Always act like you belong to be in the room. And then this idea of knowing your worth. If you could uh, go back to Virginia Tech and, and whisper some wisdom into the ears of a 20-year-old version of yourself, what would you say? Just take the classes, get them over with. Don't drag it on. <laughs> don't drag it on. Just take them. Just, just, just stick to it. Take them. It has, that, that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your sentence to read? That he was an honest man who walked around free and spent his life helping people imagine a better world through his words. Kwame Alexander, thank you for walking around shoulders back free and using your words to remind the rest of us that we can be liberated too. It's been a joy getting to know you on the podcast. I love reading your work and it's been a pleasure sharing part of your life story with our audience today. Thank you for your inspiration, John. This has been great. I appreciate this. My friends, that is Kwame Alexander. My name is John O'Leary and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Stay free. Well, my friends, about halfway through our time together, Kwame was sharing how despite his divorce, that relationship brought out a lot of positive things to his life. And then he dropped this one. Let's focus on the triumph and not necessarily just the tragedy. In a world filled with fear-mongering headlines and cable news shows reminding us that it's all tragedy, it's easy to focus, I think, on the negative. And yet Kwame reminds us that, yes, there are headwinds, there are challenges, they are real, but there are plenty of other pieces of joy, of triumph, and of positivity. My friends, if you enjoyed today's conversation with New York Times bestselling author Kwame Alexander, check out our entire playlist of curated content with New York Times bestselling authors. You'll hear inspiring conversations from some of the world's most popular authors, including Craig Rochelle, Mel Robbins, Seth Godin, Patrick Lencioni, Mitch Album, and so many others. You can find the New York Times bestselling author playlist at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. My friends, I want to thank you for tuning into this episode and for being part of our Live Inspired podcast family. Looking forward to seeing you next time. So for this time, and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day. Live Inspired.